Okay, welcome to the afternoon session, session seven, third day of Dari, uh, first international conference of Croatian Dari. The session title is Digital Infrastructure. I am glad to welcome five presenters from five different European research infrastructure consortium. Uh, we will start with uh, Edward Gray, um, Daria Herrick, Empowering Guards and Humanities Research on National Education. Edward Gray, the Research Infrastructure Coordinator, coordinator at the CNRS and the Officer for National Coordination at Daria Herrick. He leads the Curation Task Force and the Shop Project, which is developing SSL, Social Science Humanities Open Marketplace, to discover a platform for digital humanities. He earned his doctorate in history from Purdue University. Ed, the floor is yours. Thank you so much for this wonderful introduction and as well for inviting me. I really want to extend a heartfelt thank you to our organizers, our host at the University of Zadar, and especially Corey Elka, who has been our fantastic national coordinator for Daria in Croatia. So today, my task for you, can everyone see the slide? Okay. Okay, I will go ahead and share my slides. I've only been doing Zoom for six months now, so we should be able to. Everything good? Okay, very good. So thank you all so much for, for being here and coming to listen. Um, I have the, the real privilege of presenting what Daria is. Um, how do I move the screens when it's? How do I share the screen with the? To be able to move it. Yeah. Okay, we're good. We're good. We're back. Sorry. Um, it's only the digital infrastructure. Um, so. <laughs> Thank you all so much for coming. And I figured that the best way to start, even though we had a really fantastic presentation earlier from Jennifer Edmund, our president and board of directors, to remind you all, and for those that weren't here, just exactly what we're talking about when we're talking about Daria Eric. So Daria is a pan-European digital research infrastructure for the arts and humanities research. And it's really important to, to underline that we're talking about digital research infrastructure for the arts and humanities. It's not just digital humanities, but it's really all of arts and humanities as what we see is, is our mission. So we were established as an ERIC, a European Research Infrastructure Consortium in 2014. Daria is structured as a network of people, expertise and knowledge and is supported by over 20 member countries, one observer and several other research institutions and cooperating partners in non-member countries. So when we think about what Daria is here, what, what do we exist to do? Well, we, we try to empower research communities with digital methods to create, connect, and share knowledge about culture and society. The transmission of knowledge is really key to what we're doing here at Daria. Um, we share knowledge to create new connections and insights through networking, training, and projects. We also share tools to promote the work of others with similar research questions. We share data to allow new projects to start from a higher baseline. Uh, we share networks to build key relationships and seek funding. And we share a voice to be heard in the European and national policy debates. When we think about the Daria community, you can see that we have at the center in the DCO 9.2 full time equivalent course staff, and that is joined by 19, well, 20 different members since this graphic has changed. We've been fortunate enough to welcome Bosnia and Herzegovina in as our 20th full member. Um, we have 237 partner institutions, 27 cooperating partners throughout the history of the ERIC. And then it gets really exciting because when we talk about contributors, these are folks that are in the not just the international, the, the EU level of Daria, but also the national level of Daria's. We have close to 1300 contributors across the entire continent that are helping to make arts and humanities research more valuable and important. We also have, and I believe that you will all be counted in this for the, the next series of the stats, close to 15,000 event attendees in just the year 2020 alone. So we're we're it's it's not just something this but we're doing something that has real impact with many different actors across the entire continent as well when we talk about impact obviously in, in research we have to ask well who's going to pay for this well fortunately in daria we were able to, to joyously report that there has been 16.9 million euros in funding leverage in the last year now what we mean by that is this is money that comes in from european level projects but also national level projects 
And, and what we've seen is that Daria, being a part of Daria, gives you a level of, of branding. The Daria brand is strong. It is recognized by funding agencies. And this allows researchers to have a, a greater oomph when they're trying to put across their, their research agendas. And as well, we see this with the fact that there have been more than 735 publications. Again, this is in the year just 2020. This adds to the 659 that we had in 2019. And especially the biggest jump is more than 233 million platform interactions. When we gathered these stats last year, we said 6.6, .6, that seems a little low. We looked at our methodology. We took a better contact with the different national coordinators. And I think, uh, Corielke, you can confirm that I was very clear about getting that data in. Um, and we now can report, and I think this is a number that is much closer to the reality of over 233 million different platform interactions in the year 2020. So that means people logging into repositories. This means people going into websites. This means uh, social media events that were shared and seen and retweeted. This is the impact of Daria throughout the year of 2020. Now, when we talk about who's in Daria, after all, well, we have 15 founding members um, as well. We have new members since uh, 2014. So when we were founded in 2014, we started out with 15 including our, our lovely host, Croatia. Um, but since 2014, we've added even five newer members, Poland, Portugal, Bulgaria, the Czech Republic, and Bosnia and Herzegovina just this past May. And there are other countries that are observers. So this is something that exists in other X, I believe exists in Claren as well, um, where they're in the process of joining and it, and it helps them to understand what it's like to be in this infrastructure and what value can be gained. As well, we have cooperating partners. As I said, these are individual institutions that can be found in the, these countries, universities, research centers, academic institutes, and they decide to join us. And we have countries in, we have eight total current cooperating partners that can be found in Finland, Hungary, Norway, Slovakia, the United Kingdom, and my own United States. Um, so it's very nice to see that the, the range of DARI and the reach is, is, is even moving beyond the European borders because at the end of the day, digital humanists the thing I found about coming into this, to this, I, I hesitate to call it a field, but coming into digital humanists, we are people that are so close to communicating with each other. When I was a historian, there was a lot of working alone. But now that I'm in this DH world, we talk with one another, we give feedback, and it's much more coming together. And this is what I really like to see. And this is what I think one of the true values of Daria and DH in general is, is bringing different folks together to work and communicate and advance the, the interests of arts and humanities. And I think above all, and, and most importantly, Daria is people. Um, when, when we talk about the people, you see all these, these, these folks in the photograph, and this was at our annual event in 2018, which was hosted in Paris. But behind every single person you see in this photograph, there are many more that work hard to make sure that Daria is advancing its interest. And it's, it's, it's really a privilege to be here and work for these people that are so dedicated and put in so many different hours and I think it's, it's really, it's something that I remember when I first started this job, I did an interview with every one of the national coordinators because my portfolio is to sort of take care of the national coordinators and make their lives better. Although I think maybe Koyalka could dispute that um, with all the things I asked for. But, um, you know, and it's, it's, it's just so, it, it really impressed me when one came back to me and said, you know, Daria is a network of people and Daria is, a, is an infrastructure of compassion. And, and, and this same, uh, National coordinator said later on to me, you know, the thing about Daria is if you have been in Daria for any length of time and you can't get together a consortium for your research project, you're doing something wrong. This, this is what the value of Daria is. It brings people together that have similar interests and you come together and that allows you to understand, okay, we want to do something on computational literary studies. Let's get it together. Let's get the folks in Croatia. Let's get some folks in Spain. I know some people in Berlin and you can get together these research consortium. Um, and I think especially when you have this exchange that crosses national boundaries, linguistic boundaries, disciplinary boundaries, and you have everyone come together, it's this diversity of points of view, it's this diversity of ways of reflecting that makes Daria and what we're doing so important and so influential. And, and this is really why I love doing this job. I truly love this job, and not just because I get to come to Zadar in October, um, what a, a real chance it is, but it's because you get to interact with all these lovely people. And it has been a real joy. And I feel so bad for all of our, our friends following along um, because to be here in person and to finally meet the, these fine folks that I've had the privilege of working with is a real pleasure. So as well, we, start, we like to talk about impact case studies. So what can Daria actually do for you? Because I, I can give this speech and it all sounds nice with all these you know, close to 1,300 contributors and close to 15,000 events and these, but what does Daria actually do? 
Well, we have these three qualitative impact case studies that we put into our annual report for the last year. Um, and, and you can see the, the testimonies. Uh, we have advancing the state of art and with the lexical resources working group that contributed significantly into the TI initiative, the texting and coding initiative, and helping them set up their new guidelines. You also have ways of improving research capacity in Europe. We had, uh, as you can see there, the, this event that we, that we brought in Australians and they got to see the way things are done in Europe. And they said this is a really fundamental exchange. It was allowed us to open up new avenues of inquiry for research. And finally, we have open science. Earlier on, my lovely colleague Erjabet presented on open science yesterday. And you can see here as well, open science is something that Daria really works strongly to advance and advocate. And this is one of our key impact case studies that we can show that what can Daria do? We can do open science. We can help you with advancing the state of art in your research, and we can help you with your research capacity. As well, yesterday, Jennifer talked about the four strategic pillars of Daria. We talked about the marketplace of reusable tools, services, data, and knowledge. We talked about the importance of educating and training. And, and, and really, I love this idea of transnational and transdisciplinary working groups. Nothing is better, as I said, when you get people from different backgrounds and different disciplinary traditions that come together, that have different approaches to the same problem. And when you put these people in the same room, and in the past year in the same Zoom room, uh, you have all of the experience that they have that comes together and has new ways to solve the same problems that we're all interacting with. And then as well, we help with policy and foresight. There are many meetings um, I was talking with a colleague earlier today about how in the past, there were lots of meetings that happened in Brussels and there were back and forth trips all the time because advocating and doing policy is very important and very core to what we do. So let's go through these four pillars now in, in concrete actions. And this is something that is near and dear to my heart. I, I spend a lot of time with the Shock Project and the SSH Open Marketplace. And it's, it's really an interesting project. It was started as a consortium. There are 45 different partners in the Shock Consortium. Um, including the, the, the five major uh, SSH ERICs. So that's Daria, Clarin, Sesta, Erich, ESS, and Shep. Um, as well, you, you have the fact this lasts for 40 months. So this will be up here at the end of uh, next April. So we're six months away. We're not feeling the pressure whatsoever. We're definitely going to get it done. Um, we had a very generous budget um, that, that allowed us to, to really implement this fantastic marketplace. Um, and the, the idea is really to create this, this, this social science and humanities part of the open science cloud, the, the European open science cloud, which is so important, which is such an important policy part that we all are having to interact with whether we want to or not. And this is to try and claim the stake of what can SSH do? What can SSH contribute when we're going up against fields like astronomy, biology, chemists that have all of this, this baggage and history of data, what, what can humanities bring to this? Well, we can actually bring quite a bit. And, and this is what the shock project was meant to do. We're, we're trying to maximize reuse through open science and fair principles. It's something that underlines everything that I've done in shock is how can we make this data more fair? How can we make it more findable? How can we make it more interoperable, reusable? Um, we're trying to interconnect an existing infrastructures that I had a colleague once that told me one of the best things to come out of the shock project is the fact that now these SSH infrastructures speak with one another. That you have Clarin and Daria that always had a strong interaction, but it's even stronger now that you're putting Clarin and Daria in contact with SESTA, with ESS, with SHARE. This is what's really valuable. And this is one of the best things that come out of the shock project. And as well, coming up with a governance model for how do you take SSH and how you get that into the EOS and how do you make that work in a sustainable long-term way? So what I can talk to you a little bit about is about this marketplace that you heard so much about. And it's really one of the key services of the Shock Project and it's led by Daria in that work package. We're currently in the beta release um, and it will the, the final release will be happening at the end of this year. Um, and, and what it does, what does this do? It's a discovery portal for tools and services and it puts them into context. You have the tools, services, they get put into context with other tools and services with training materials, with data sets, with workflows, with publications. It's not just, oh, I need a tool to do something, but it's supposed to be an entire ecosystem that will tell you, okay, I want to do something, how can I do that? And then you have the context that's given in terms of publications. You can see how your fellow scholars are addressing these same problems. You can see how, oh, I don't know how to use this, but I would like to, well, we have a training material for that. Or you have a specific problem you want to accomplish, there's a workflow that will guide you through the steps of how you go from taking a, trans, uh, a handwritten document and taking it into something that is exploitable in TIA form. And really the three guiding principles of the marketplace are contextualization, which I just spent quite a bit emphasizing, curation, this idea that this is not something that will just be put up and on April 2022 it will be frozen in place and will never be updated again. 
No, there's a governance model that is behind it to make sure that the content is updated, that it is up to date, and it allows contributors as well to come in and say, hey, my tool's not in here. I would like it to be in there. And they can suggest that. Or I actually work with this tool a lot, and I think this is out of date. Please update this. And, and we want it to be a living and we want it to continue to be useful moving forward. And that is why we put so much work into the questions of sustainability and governance. And then this leads into the final part of the community. Why make a discovery portal if it's not useful for anyone? It is you, the users, that are so useful for us. These are the key. It is built to help you. So if we're not going to implicate you in the decisions and the process that we're taking, there's no reason to do it. And that's why contextualization, curation, and community all work together. They're really three sides, they're the three legs of this table that holds up the SSH open marketplace. What does it look like? Well, here's the, the, the Clarin uh, D web anno, and you can see the way this works is you have this button, go to the tool or service. And because the thing that's important is the SSH open marketplace does not host any tools. It, it, it gives you the link to go on to other places, but what it does is it puts it in context. So you can see the workflows on linguistic annotation or manual annotation that will tell you Okay, I want to annotate. Okay, this is how it can be used. It gives you further details as what is the source of this? Where is it from? It gives you the idea of the language is English. Um, it, it's, it's still in beta, we're working on it. There will be more information in the future, but for now we're, we're, we're still quite happy with the way things are. As well, a use case. I'm a historian of 16th and 17th century France. You were not going to escape from this presentation without some manuscripts. So this is a manuscript that came from 1560 and basically, handwritten text recognition, which we had a, a presentation on earlier today. Who has time to read this? Um, when I was younger and, and didn't want to get involved in DH, I had time to read this. And then I got older and wiser and realized that the machine is there to help you. So handwritten text recognition is one of the greatest things to come out because who has time to read pages upon pages of this? Well, we can tell you how to do this with a training and workflow. How can you extract textual, textual content from images, whether it is through OCR, optical character recognition, or HCR, handwritten text recognition? And these are pedagogical resources to show you how to accomplish tasks. This is what a workflow is. This is really one of the added values of the SSH marketplace. Because before I said we don't host, which is true, except workflows. Workflows are entirely hosted on the marketplace because they need to be hosted on the workplace, on the marketplace. That way we can put them into contact in the individual steps with all the other tools, services, publications, and data sets that are relevant to them. So let's go in and take a look at this workflow. This is again, the same workflow of how do I get an image from text? It tells you, okay, I need to define the characteristics of the outcome. And then you can click the button that says expand. And I've expanded for number four here to choose the engine based on the type of content. And it explains to you, okay, you can use one of these different models and it gives you the links to transcribe this, which we heard about earlier today. You can use Tesseract, uh, tools for textization, all these different tools that tell you, you can use this or this or this. And when you click one of those buttons, it will take you to that page, which will link to you more information. Here's a publication about transcribe this. Here's a training material about transcribe this. And it really runs you through these research workflows that are meant to be, for the researcher, very useful and real. As well, training and education is very important to Daria, and I'd like to focus some time on Daria campus. Of course, it's not the only one that we have. We also have the DH course registry, which is registered and, and run in, in partnership with our friends in Clarin. Uh, we also have Daria Teach, which feeds into Daria campus, as well as the Twitter campaign, Training Tuesday, where we share different training tips. And what you can do when you go into Daria campus is you can browse your content whether it's resources, whether it's recording of events, whether it's pathfinders, which are a curated series of resources that will explain to you in depth how to approach a different subject. So you can go and say, I'm interested in a particular topic. You can see this is a screenshot I took this morning of all the different particular topics that are available and all the tags. And I believe for the purpose of the next slide, I said, well, let's find something out about data management. Well, data management, you can see you have all these different resources that are stacked on top of one another. You can go through with the little link that's there and you can see, okay, is this something that interests me? And then you can click through if you decide. And resources, these can be courses, these can be lessons, these can be textual, these can be videos, these can be presentations, these can be workshops that were taken. So here we have the Winter School from the Zero Project where it is an entire workshop, this winter school that was put online, and that way that even if you weren't there in 2018, you can be here in 2021 and access this material. We also say it's very important to have working groups, and we've heard quite a bit about working groups already in the context of uh, the, this conference, but here are just a, a quick sample. These are five of the 20 total active groups that we have. So Geo Humanities that deals with geographical data, Daria Teach that focuses on um, 
training and resources, medievalist sources, which focus on the sources to do medieval history, the Atralia, which was so expertly presented to us yesterday by Anna Maria, and of course, Elda, ethics and legality in digital arts and humanities, which I'll spend some more time on for those that could not attend the fantastic session this Wednesday. What this does is this focus on really fundamental questions that we have to, to interact with of what does privacy mean? Do we trust the researcher? How do you handle confidentiality? How, how do we deal with this GDPR thing that we have had to deal with forever since 2018? Ethical issues about attribution, about abuse in research. How do we approach these fundamental subjects? How do we treat our subject with the respect that they're due? How do we conduct ourselves as a scholar? How do we do research? What is the proper way to behave? Copyright, which is something that is very important and increasingly so in the world of open access and of course, open licensing. And I think to show you concretely, what can this do? Well, Elda gave us the consent form wizard, which you can find in the link there, consent.area.eu, which will run you through the steps. It is not legal advice, um, but it will run you through the steps of how to come up with the form that will meet the consent parameters that are set up in the, the GDPR. So these are something that has been created by a working group in Daria that is put available for all researchers across Europe. And, and I think this is one of really the, the sort of key exploitable results we can say, what can Daria do for you? Well, you, you, you don't know how to do a GTPR. Well, you can go through this form and it can help you out. And, and finally, I wanna spend some time here at the end of my talk on Daria nationally, because we've talked quite a bit about what Daria can do on a European level, but where Daria really shines is on the national level. Um, so what is a Daria national consortium? Well, member states, all those 20 that I talked about, they form a national consortium. The national consortium is made up of a national coordinating institution plus partner institutions. And, and the NC institution is the one that's in charge. They're the one that housed the national coordinator. This is the person that represents the scientific role who is in charge of running the consortium on a daily basis. The national consortium is represented in the instance of Daria by the political side, the national representative. And they are the people that attend and vote in, in the general assembly. Now, to, to, to bring it back to Croatia, the national coordinator and national representative is, is Koryalka. You can do both. But in other countries, you have it where it's different. You have a national coordinator and a different national representative. And you can see here this page from the 2020 Daria annual report. We went through and asked all of our different nations, what are you proud of? What did you accomplish in 2020? What would you like to share with everyone in, in one or two quick points? And you can see the diversity that you have. You know, in Ireland, they're working on a, a UK-Ireland collaboration in DH. In Greece, they, they accomplished a fantastic Twitter conference online. This was in April 2020, a scary time when we didn't know if we would have the joy of meeting in person again. And they said, well, it's important to continue talking about DH, we'll do it online. Um, you have Belgium that is working on their infrastructure and has, has moved forward and they're really advancing in the projects of open humanities. France is starting a program with regional research infrastructures that are based in, in the different French regions to bring them more into harmony with the national and international levels. Germany worked extensively on the shock project with us. Croatia was awarded national funding. Over and over again, we see the success that has been carried out by our national consortia and all the fantastic work that they're doing that really proves the vitality of Daria. But it's also so vital because it is diverse. When you have countries like Croatia, like France, Germany, Malta, that are all in the same thing, you can't expect the same things of them. But within their national context and within their national means, they do really, really interesting things that are very successful. So you see in, in Italy, they're building a technical infrastructure based on data centers hosted around Italy. In Belgium, they have working groups, much like we do on the EU level, but on a national level. In France, as I said, we're working to integrate regional research infrastructures, the Maison de saint -Gerome. In Germany, they're transitioning from project-based funding to setting up a legal entity association that exists and will continue to exist. In Daria Greek, they have partner institutions that each have a specific role in how they contribute to the consortium. In Daria Ireland, they're working on the partnership with UK universities interested in DH. And there's so much more that's behind it. And of course, everyone here, at, at least in Croatia, knows the wonderful work that's already being done by Daria HR. I, I'd like to, to spend a little time on the one I know the best, Daria FR Humanum. One of the things that we do is that we help researchers at all stages of the data life right cycle. So it starts with data, how you organize your data. Then how do you collect that data? How do you process it? How do you preserve it and make sure it's there into the future? How do you publish it so you can get credit? And how do you reuse it afterwards and make it so that other scholars can come through and make sure this data is what they want? And we have tools you can see behind them. All the, all the tools underneath that allow scholars and researchers to go through and make sure that this entire life cycle of data can be handled. And this is the power of one 
national consortium, and we have many more. Poland is in the process. They just received a fantastic grant to build a similar process throughout Poland. And it's, it's really fantastic and, and heartwarming for me to see all the fantastic work that is being done across Europe. And of course, this is on the Digital Humanities and Heritage Conference, so I couldn't go through and not talk about the, the implication that we have. So you can see here, this is a survey, again, I did earlier in the year, and asked, as your national consortium, do you, what context do you have with the, the cultural heritage in, in your country? And you can see that over 60% of our members do have contacts, because oftentimes you have the National Library, the National Archives, National Museums, Regional Museums and Archives that are involved in, in the, the National Consortium as partner institutions. Other times, you know, it can be a little more difficult because, you know, in, in sort of the political side of things, often DARIA Consortium are hosted by the research ministry and cultural heritage is in the culture ministry. And sometimes for political reasons, it's difficult to get together. So you have some context. These are the informal context where you work together on projects, you consult one another, but any sort of formal conversation can be really difficult sometimes for political reasons and then other ones that said no but in every case when I when someone said no we don't really have that many contacts it's something they're in the process of exploring in the process of working on because all of these Daria National Consortium are at different stages of their life cycle all of them are working to build and I think that's what's so interesting is this is not finished Daria and Daria nationally is not a finished project we're building it gets more exciting and more complete and more interesting every year and it's really fantastic to see it's grown. In just the 10 months I've been in this position, I've seen how things have grown. And I can't wait to see how things will look in 10 years. As well, here are some examples. You have Lindat, which is the, the, the Czech Daria. It's, it's a Clary, in fact, it's, it's this fusion between Daria and Clary. And they opened up access to a proper, approximately 100 million digitized pages with all of the different library contacts. This happened during Corona to make sure that researchers had access that they needed to continue their research despite the lockdowns. In Belgium, they're founding a data lab at the KBR, the Royal Library. And they're doing another project focused on text and data mining in concert with the mass digitization campaign. In Portugal, they're building the Rossio infrastructure, which is deeply fascinating because they're trying to digitize and make available Portuguese heritage documents. They're recognizing the global influence that Portugal had and how all of these archives are locked away in Lisbon and other cities in Portugal. And they're specifically making them digitized to make them available for those in Brazil and Angola and all the other former colonies so that people do not have to, to go to Lisbon to make research. So I have a couple parting thoughts for you. Daria helps scholars by enabling their national research infrastructures to serve. This is, this is something we do. It's not the most seen impact in terms of one-on-one -on -one for an individual researcher, but they're, we're there to make sure the people that help them are better at what they do. But we, we also make them go in contact. We place them in contact with other like-minded scholars in the context of projects or in working groups, as we discussed earlier. Intangibly, Daria also places infrastructures and people together. We allow for exchange from diverse backgrounds and points of view. And this is really such a precious motor of research. It's the third time I'm saying it because I truly believe that when you have diverse viewpoints and diverse backgrounds coming together, that is when the best research happens. And then finally, I wanna emphasize for a final time, Daria is built on people. We do this with workshops, working groups. Knowledge exchange is key to the infrastructure. Anybody can give you money to buy machines and software, but Daria can enable you to use them. Okay. Thank you so much. <laughs> Thank you, Ed. Uh, do I have a question? <laughs> uh, last year, I, I was uh, with a group of international reviewers for the French Ministry of Science that was spent 400 million euros. So now there is no NDA anymore. So I can now reveal some <laughs> secrets from that. There was a um, huge amount of international funds to, to fund into uh, research infrastructure and with a special guiding from the uh, Ministry of Science to push more money in social science and humanities projects. Now, uh, using national funds is very important to build national uh, infrastructure. Uh, it is, can just say a few words about how much money we spend in, in building national France, where if infrastructure, if you have some advice to our colleagues in Croatia, how to make a uh, good project proposal to use money to build digital infrastructure. Uh, well, it, I, I'm going to take the, the coward's way out in, in <laughs> saying that the decisions of how to get and use the money takes place above my head. Um, 
But you know, in terms of how to efficiently use this money, I think the number one thing to invest on is people. And you need to invest in the contacts. Researchers need to know that you exist. That's the fundamental thing. If we are here as researchers, and we have this in French, ingénieur à l'appui de la recherche, an engineer that is there to help researchers. And if the researchers don't know we exist and don't know what we do, then we have no reason to exist. They, they need to know that the resources are there and we need to work on communicating the services that we provide. And, and I, I think really when you get into the process of explaining to researchers, because it can be so hard to reach the researcher, the researcher that has teaching obligations, that has research obligations, their kid is sick and there, there is so little time sometimes. And we need to make sure that they know that we exist and we're there to help them. And, and I think that is something that applies at all levels, no matter how mature or new or in construction your research infrastructure is, communicating and reaching out to your people, your user base is the most important thing that you can do. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Okay. Uh, I'd like to welcome my colleague, friend, Mark Tadic, as an ex-speaker. Uh, Mark Tadic will present uh, our emails. Uh, Mark will do for a period of English, <laughs> full professor at the University of Russia, Faculty of Humanity. We think Mark is well known in our community and coordinating the creation of our emails. In his presentation, he will give us a brief overview of activities at national level to mark the March. Yes, excellent. Thank you very much. But um, sure. the first part of my talk will tell something about uh, how Clarine came up at all. Maybe this part would be better presented by Daria Fisher, who is sitting down there. She used to be uh, she used to be a director for user involvement up, um, up until a few months ago in Clarine Eric. She's from Ljubljana. But anyway, um, also uh, I would like to keep in mind that uh, this uh, talk also is a part of the, my morning's previous talk, at least and if you look at it from this chronological perspective that I that I managed to to show you earlier, I hope. So um, Marine started as a project that lasted from 2008 to 2011. And uh, the initial meeting was in February 2006, where several language technology groups across around Europe came together and it almost exploded. It almost never occurred. Uh, but happily, we had a very wise man in the person of Stephen Crower, who, who took the lead. And uh, in a project proposal, actually, this project proposal resulted in the position in the first Asprey roadmap. Levy, as well as Daria at that time. But it also resulted in the FP7 research infrastructure project, and that was called Clarine. Uh, in this project, we had 33 partners across uh, the Europe, so either member or existing states, and it was sort of bottom up building process for later Clarine Eric, because this project actually was a preparatory phase. Or Eric, uh, later Eric, proper infrastructure. Actually, we provided sort of blueprint for that. Okay? And uh, then in 2012, uh, since few years before that, the, the EU re legal uh, regulation was adopted, uh, and uh, European Research Infrastructure Consortium, as a special legal entity, has been established uh, allowed by European uh, uh, law, then the, the Clarine actually became ERIC in um, 8th of April of 2012, the 8th, and uh, hosted by the uh, Dutch Ministry of Culture and something else, I don't know what, what all. Uh, so there were nine founding members at that time. Uh, today, as of 1st of October, we have 22 members, three observers, and one third party institution. So you can see the growth. And um, 
Regarding the language technologies, um, put this in perspective on my morning talk. Uh, research infrastructures are somewhat limited in scope. First, they are oriented towards researchers only, I would say. Second, Clarin uh, is predominantly oriented towards humanities and social sciences uh, researchers, but it's also open to other areas. I'm sure that, for instance, psychiatrists could find a lot of interesting language resources in Clarin, as well as probably some other anthropologist or anyone else. Well, depends where you put anthropology. Uh, and you can know, notice here, since I'm a linguist, I'm coming from humanities, I use acronym HSS. And someone who's coming from sociology, they would use SSH. Okay. <clears throat> so uh, in national consortia around Clarine, there's a quite a limited number of non-research partners. So you can have like NGOs or, or some uh, professional organizations, but usually the, the main, the, the leading partners are always research institutions, either institutes or, or universities. And um, becoming a member of Clarine is, uh, I would say, you need a favorable political climate in your country. And I remember, for instance, Daria was much luckier than Clarine in Croatia, in, in, the, in the very same, with the very same ministry, I would say. We, we, we had the letter of understanding uh, signed by, uh, acting, by the minister at that time in, in December 2010, Fuchs, rather than Fuchs. And then we had the general elections and the change in power, and then everything was installed until 2018, something like that. Incredible. But Daria managed to, to go further even earlier, 2016. So, yeah, as early as that, yes. It's a whole different story. But anyway, uh, so what I want to say, use this opportunity whenever it opens as, and, and to, to its full extent. Well, annual fees, uh, uh, annual fees depend on national BDP. So uh, for smaller countries like uh, Latvia, Lithuania, Croatia, Bulgaria, uh, it's uh, 16,000 euros per year. That's, you know, come on. You can buy Dacia for that, though. not even a serious car. <laughs> okay. and, um, and, but one thing is uh, by the statutes of Clarine obligatory, obligatory that's the financial support to the national consortium local, from, from the local ministry. That's obligatory. And of course, you can find a lot of uh, information at this website where Clarine's uh, Eric is available. So this is a map which shows you what, which are the full members, which are the observers. You can see observer Carnegie Mellon University in the United States as a third party. And then one observer is South Africa. So we are going out of Europe, as you can see. Uh, Iceland, you can call it out of Europe, but in fact, it, it, it is not. So what is actually Clarine Eric? There are two very nice slogans on uh, Clarine's new website. I hope, Daria, you were the author of the slogans. <laughs> yes or not? No, that came before my time. Okay. So, uh, we, just a few months ago, there, there has been a new refurbished website called Clarine going public and uh, with a little bit more uh, dissemination uh, efforts put into it and, and we have these two very nice slogans but in fact it's uh, so why is why is language technology so important and you see text in any form so written spoken or as e-text and i would call it the third medium of appearance of, of text is epistemologically very important for humanities and social sciences for very two plain reasons. First one is the primary object of this research is either text itself. So that covers any linguistics, uh, philology, phonetics, and so on. Or the primary object of research of these sciences is mediated by text. So in this case, text is the medium through where the objects of research are presented. Literary theory, history, ethnology, anthropology, psychology, and so forth. Okay. So this is like epistemological basis for, for these sciences and their object of 
the research. So if we can help the researchers by automating the text processing, that will help them in their research a lot. And that's, that's the main idea behind all Clarin. So Clarin aims at collecting digital language resources and tools from all over Europe, of course, and as you can see by members beyond Europe. And they should be, and they are accessible through a common online environment, like a single query line you have in Google, in each country you have Google one query line. So the same idea was behind this approach. And also uh, Clarine wants to support res researchers in, by that, by these language technologies, uh, researchers in humanities and social sciences. Very, very important thing is regarding in the, the, the talk about under-resourced languages I, I had this morning. Very important key, I would say, uh, uh, approach is that all languages are treated equal. There's no small or big languages in this respect. And so for, it's, it's important to share the knowledge about each and every language and know how, how to process that. Uh, together with the, uh, the HPC processing power that is offered within the research infrastructure. And that uh, high performance computing processing power is actually to support research for the languages that, for instance, do not have enough collected large corpora. But once they get that, they pass the need the threshold, then they can use HP, HPC power from a center that's offered. And uh, therefore, the under-resourced languages can participate completely on equal grounds uh, in clearing infrastructure, either by offering or getting access to other language resources. And the same is valid for APG, HPC facilities. And this has been introduced, uh, this has been uh, achieved through the Federation of Digital Repositories of Language Data that are aggregated only at the level of common metadata. Okay? And um, of course, the national authorization and authentication services are, are the ones that are being used for access there. So very much like Eduron that works everywhere, you use this, actually you can use this very same thing. So Clarin is uh, composed of B-centers, the network is composed of B-centers and K-centers. B-centers are repositories, K-centers are support knowledge centers. And um, for instance, uh, you can uh, go at Clarin website and see which are language re resources ready to use. So you can immediately start and use them. You have these processing pipelines, for instance, that can process language at different levels, not just thematization or parts of speech, but also dependency parsing, semantic rule, labeling, and so on and so forth. Or you can simply try and check the resource families. So you, we have a very nice uh, classification of different resources by the medium or by, by their main idea or by the number of languages, whether it's monolingual or multilingual and so on. Okay, so this brings me to, uh, to the end with, with my uh, few slides on Croatian Clarin Consortium. So Croatia became member in 2018. And um, for simple reason, uh, so at that time we asked for, okay, that's very nice that uh, ministry signs uh, the contract so that we, we become a full member, but how about the uh, funding of national consortium? So that thing, you know, was installed for another year. So if you want to, and sometimes you have to be very patient. Okay, And then I said to the, to the ministers that that was, uh, I told, I told her, look, we will not start anything unless you provide us with at least two full-time FTEs, so full-time researchers. And that took almost a year to be approved, a little more than that. But what you can, so you can attribute that to me. I'm guilty as charged. I was the one actually who initiated this rule that actually became the general rule for any research infrastructure in Croatia, that every research infrastructure is entitled to employ two FTEs after that. 
So that only happened in, in the case of Clarine by in the second half of 2020, okay? Because then you have to get the approval by the university as well. It's not the same thing in your institute, so you could do it more straightforward. Unfortunately, we had to get approval from the university, and that's not the easiest task, as you know, as people from university know. Okay, so Croatian Clarine Consortium has eight partners, three faculties from the, uh, actually two faculties from the University of Zagreb and Computing Center, uh, two public institutes, and uh, two libraries, National and University Library and Library of the Academy, and then one NGO, which is uh, Croatian Language Technology Society, okay? And uh, of course, this is not the end. I mean, Croatian Clarine Consortium is open for widening. We would very much like to see, for instance, universities outside of Zagreb. But we would like to widen the consortium on the basis of successful collaboration. So that would be, I think, very good grounds to, to widen up these consortiums. And our plans are to establish a B center in midterm period. There are several possible platforms that we are discussing about, and we'll check which one to choose. Um, we would like to also establish in short term a K center for a national language for Croatian language. This is usually. This is usually the case in any country. And in midterm, probably a key case center for glagolitic script. That would be very interesting uh, because then it would become a European wide uh, knowledge center for glagolitic. And I see, I know that there are very important activities running at the University of Zagreb, uh, Zadar, but also, for instance, uh, what is usually not known in Europe, medieval Latin. Latin is the second language of Croatian literature. It was the official language of the Croatian parliament until 1847. We have parliamentary discussions written, led and written minutes in Latin still. And of course, people in West have no idea about that. And of course, uh, there's a possible usage of grid infrastructure that Sirsa is offering all around. For instance, for guys, uh, Benedict is not here today, but he was asking about the clusters of GPUs. I know Sertza has quite a number of clusters of GPUs. So if you want to find out more, please visit our website. You have the address down there. And thank you for your attention. Thank you, Marta. Uh... We are moving to the speaker, Shumek Smolich, coming from the University of the Faculty of Economics and Business, professor. Uh, Shumek will tell us a little bit more about sharing the way of health aging in the environment in Europe. Shumek, please. Uh, thank you for this uh, short introduction. <laughs> uh, okay, okay. No, no problem at all. Uh, just the surname Smolich, not Smolich. Uh, I have oh. to, to correct to always. <laughs> it's, uh, it's, it's more common. So the, the surname comes from this part of Croatia. I'm here nearby Zadar, but working in Zagreb. So I will I'll, I will present the survey of health aging and retirement in Europe. Uh, share Eric. Uh, uh, I come from the Faculty of Economics and Business, uh, University of Zagreb. Uh, this is an institution that coordinates the SHARE project in Croatia and its scientific partner institution of the uh, SHARE ERIC. Okay. So um, SHARE ERIC actually was the first ERIC uh, and became the first European Research Infrastructure Consortium uh, in 2011. Uh, but the project started in 2004. Uh, 12 countries joined uh, in 2004 and started the survey of health aging and retirement in Europe. Uh, Sherik uh, seat is in Munich today, but it was in Tilburg uh, at the beginning, and the central coordination is located at MEA, uh, Munich Center for the Economics of Aging, uh, the Max Planck Institute of, for Social Law and, uh, and Social Policy in uh, Germany. Uh, the coordinator of the share uh, is uh, Professor Axel Boschupan. And uh, the project uh, share, uh, and the, the main goal of this project is to uh, help researchers to understand better the aging process or and the impact of population aging on European societies. Uh, 
the project uh, actually uh, tries to 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 uh, inform policymakers or to provide the informed uh, decision making uh, in uh, health, social, and economic uh, sphere. Uh, today, until today, share uh, database contains uh, more than four hundred eighty interviews with one uh, hundred. Uh, 40,000 people aged 50 and older. Uh, Share Eric tries to uh, and, and has fulfilled in the wave seven in 2017 to cover all uh, EU member states. Uh, so today uh, we have 28 European countries and Israel in this uh, in the Share project. Uh, uh, among 28 European countries, there is also Switzerland and uh, not a member of the European Union. So uh, uh, back to history, uh, Sherik started with five uh, funding members in uh, 2011, Austria, Belgium, Czech Republic, Germany and Netherlands. And then uh, Italy joined uh, soon after in 2013, Greece, uh, uh, Israel, Slovenia, Sweden, and so on. Croatia joined uh, Share Eric uh, in 2018, but became a partner of the Share project in uh, 2015, 2014, 2015 in the wave uh, six. So there is difference between Share Eric members and the partners of the project Share. So we have 28 uh, countries, 28 European countries, and, and Israel. And then we have 16 members of the Share Eric. Uh, about Share Eric impact, uh, it, it, it's great, great uh, uh, impact. Uh, last year we celebrated 10 years of the Share Eric, and here are some key dates, uh, key years for uh, Share Eric. So from the from the beginning, from the start, from the 2011 until. Uh, last year, the, 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 after the outbreak, when Share for the first time switched from uh, uh, to telephone interviews, uh, I will talk something about that later. But as it was mentioned before, everything is to help people, to help researchers to, uh, uh, to, to uh, understand better the process of aging and the impact of population aging to European societies. It was very important to, uh, to, to have all EU member states, uh, and uh, as I said before, it was fulfilled in 2017 during the wave uh, nine. So we talk about uh, the study, the longitudinal study that is multidisciplinary, multinational, and uh, harmonized, uh, trying to, to give, give some answers uh, about population aging. And here you can see uh, the impact uh, in terms of share registered users. Uh, so until uh, the beginning of October 2021, uh, there were more than 13,000 users of the shared data, uh, registered users. Uh, the data are available free of charge uh, and uh, only past registration is needed to access the, the data. Uh, you can see here the distribution across the countries, across the world. Uh, Germany is uh, uh, first place, and you can see here there are 54 registered users from uh, Croatia. Again, uh, the situation from the beginning of October uh, this, this year. So uh, the, the international impact is, is quite big, and there are the, the share family, the, the users of the share data uh, uh, is, is extremely big, and uh, there is one impressive uh, uh, information that, that each day we produce uh, at least one, uh, one uh, top-ranked scientific paper. So it, it's really the, the impact is, is uh, to uh, research community is uh, really big. I, I will not speak a lot about the numbers, about the costs, but I will tell you that, that each wave, which lasts for two years, so we started from the first wave in 2004, and today we, we are starting the wave nine. So the cost of each wave is about 13 million euro. Uh, uh, this, is, this is a cost estimation uh, for the wave eight uh, that was implemented at the end of 2019. So uh, roughly uh, we, we talk about 30, 30 million euros uh, per, per wave for two years. Uh, the funding, 
um, I would just say the European Commission invested more than 100 million euros in this project so far, but there is a huge contribution of uh, each country for uh, to, to finance uh, the field work, uh, the, the field work, field work operations, uh, and uh, also uh, some additional uh, additional cost of this uh, infrastructure. Uh, now, just just a bit uh, uh, a few information about Sharek in Croatia. So uh, Croatia joined uh, Project Share in 2014-2015, uh, which is the wave six. And uh, we became scientific partner institution, uh, so the partner of, of the Share Eric, uh, but uh, full member uh, of the Share Eric, uh, uh, Croatia, Croatia became full member of the Share Eric in 2018. Uh, Faculty of Economics and Business is the scientific partner institution of the Share Eric. And uh, until 2018, we were uh, observer country in this uh, Sherry Council. Uh, today, this status has, for example, Switzerland. Uh, we are represented now by the Ministry of Labor, Pension System and Social Policy. It's a bit uh, strange, but uh, uh, within this ministry, we managed to secure the funding for the share uh, for three waves of the share project in Croatia. Uh, uh, in particular through the European Social Fund. Uh, this, is, this was the only way, the only uh, possible way in that time, so we talk about uh, 2014, 2015, uh, to, to uh, secure the financing of quite expensive field work uh, in, this, in this study. Uh, we also have continued support of the Ministry of Science and Edu Education since 2014, uh, mainly through the membership membership fee, and uh, also we got to, to full to time equivalent uh, researchers. Uh, uh, they were uh, employed uh, in the mid of uh, 2020, so almost one one year ago, I think. Uh, so. Uh, this is this is about the, the, the coordination we uh, as a faculty of economic and business coordinate and we are national coordinate coordinating institution of the share project in Croatia. Uh, and uh, today uh, we mainly uh, when it comes to funding, we mainly rely on uh, European social fund. Uh, this funding will end in the mid of 2023 we hope to cover wave wave 10. And uh, I, I think we will continue this in the share two zero. Uh, currently, share wave nine is ongoing in twenty seven European countries and Israel. Uh, I must say, uh, Ireland is not included. Uh, Ireland is missing. Uh, twenty seven, not twenty seven EU countries. You have twenty six and Switzerland. Uh, we are going back to face-to-face -face interviews. Th this was a huge challenge for the share in the last uh, year after the outbreak because uh, we, we, we have quite long uh, 60 to 90 minute minute face-to-face uh, -face interview with respondents who are 50 plus and it was difficult to switch to the telephone to Kati. Uh, we did this. We did two waves of uh, uh, share corona survey. We got one uh, nice uh, financial support from uh, the U uh, European uh, Commission for this uh, this project, uh, Share COVID-19. And uh, now the future looks like this. Uh, Share Eric will end in 2024. So we have to see what will happen later after the wave 10, after we, we finish uh, the wave 10. And uh, there are some ideas uh, how this will uh, proceed in the future. Share will definitely move from Munich to Berlin, uh, and uh, it is called Share 2.0 after 2024. Uh, Share will change a bit, uh, so we will go to uh, more frequent focus studies that will be shorter, and uh, probably the future is. Uh, for, for this project is uh, mixed mode, face-to-face uh, -face interviews in, in the pandemic uh, proved to be quite challenging. And uh, uh, yes, under, under this pressure, uh, Share will definitely uh, make some, some changes. Share Eric strives to cover all EU member states. Uh, we're still missing some countries. Uh, uh, as you could see, 16 uh, member states are now, uh, 16 EU member st uh, states are in Share Eric, uh, but uh, 
well, we hope that other countries will will join. This also means that the countries should be committed to finance uh, research operations within within the shared uh, project. Yes, uh, that's that's uh, that's the last slide. Thank you for uh, your attention. If you want to find out more, there is a national webpage and uh, also for the Share Project uh, International and uh, my email for any further questions. Thank okay. you again. My apologies. Uh, uh, okay, let's go with um, Mariana. It's uh, the new Eric, uh, the third one in today's session. It's about Delta and Mariana Blavis works at the Library of Faculty of Humanities and so Social Science. Mariana is well known in our community for a long time. She is representing Croatia in uh, Delta Eric Service Providers Forum. Mariana can take the floor and lead us to. So thank you all for coming and of course thank to organizers for inviting me here uh, in this uh, common community, I would say. Uh, so uh, as Ivan said, my name is Mariana Glavica. I come from Faculty of Humanities and Social Sciences at University of Zagreb uh, and I'm currently uh, acting head of the Croatian Social Science Data Archive. Uh, which is the service provider for SESDA ERIC consortium. Uh, so I, I switched a bit uh, this focus from uh, uh, SESDA ERIC. I will first talk about a service provider and then put it in the context of, uh, of, of this uh, international organization. Uh, but before that, and I think this is a nice continuation of uh, what Shime was uh, talking about research in the social sciences. Uh, so in the research in social, I will first try to describe a, a, a few components, few uh, components of uh, research in social sciences, especially empirical research. And as we could hear from Shime, this kind of uh, research can be uh, very complex. Uh, we always strive for representatives there, uh, and uh, being complex is also uh, extremely, it can be ex extremely uh, uh, organ uh, organizationally demanding and also, also financially demanding. But the data collected during this uh, research efforts, uh, be it quantitative or, or qualitative, uh, are usually very rich in content. Uh, so the point is that uh, the answers that we get in this kind of research uh, cannot be uh, the questions that are asked in this, re uh, this research cannot be answered within just one scientific paper. So the, the data set can be reused over and over again, uh, be it uh, from uh, original researcher or from uh, anybody else. Uh, and also to understand society, uh, it is often uh, necessary to compare historical and contemporary social phenomena. So that's why uh, comparative and longitudinal studies in social science are of great value. Uh, so, so, for instance, the key point here is the date that uh, the data on what people thought believed uh, or, or felt at some historical moment, and we are actually uh, now living in one, uh, one of this kind of this moment, we are now living in, in this moment. So we cannot collect it in, a, in a 10 years, we can collect it now and then compare uh, with future research, compare it, uh, what, what happened in the, uh, in the meantime. Uh, so that was that introduction was uh, was to help us uh, slightly why we need uh, social science data archives and uh, and actually we had social science uh, data archives for a long time uh, for instance uk data archive is more than 50 years ago uh, established uh, i recently received uh, from an, our norwegian colleagues uh, an invitation to celebrate their 50 years of existence. We have colleagues in Slovenia who exist for more than 20 years. 
So it's, it, it really has some history. So what we, uh, what we do in uh, social science data archive, excuse me, uh, in Croatian social science data archive, as well as, as, as in other archives, we are trying to preserve data for a long term. In order to do that, we need a strong organizational infrastructure. So it's not just about technology, it's not just about managing digital objects, but it's also about building a strong organization which can sustain this, uh, this effort for the, for the, for the future. We, of course, we are, of course, enabling access to, to data. We are publishing data. We are providing resistant identifiers. We are regulating access, and we are taking care of uh, standards, of course. When I say regulating access, uh, this means that, uh, that lots of data produced in social sciences uh, should be right access to this data should be regulated because uh, social scientists are usually collecting personal data lots of personal data so this data cannot be exposed to to public very easily uh, we have to maintain some uh, trust mechanisms uh, in order to enable access to data so in general we are trying to lower the barriers of data reuse so that's why we are not just uh, publishing data, we are also uh, providing support uh, in data management for researchers, and this is during the, the whole life cycle of the project. For instance, uh, researchers are contacting us uh, in, the, in the first phases of their project, uh, for, when they are um, uh, uh, the, when they are uh, writing uh, consent forms, for instance, for uh, for part participants, because we need to tell participants that their data will be shared and in which way and with whom. Uh, also promoting data reuse and secondary analysis uh, in new research is one of our uh, goals and uh, activities. Uh, and in recent times, there is uh, lots of, uh, sorry, <laughs> we, we talk a uh, lot about uh, research transparency and also about open access uh, to data. And as I said, in social sciences, this open access is sometimes not uh, easily achievable, but it is achievable. You, you probably heard this sentence, open as pos possible, closed as necessary. So we are uh, dealing with, uh, with that. So now I come to uh, CESDA, to this consortium of European social science uh, data archives. Uh, and uh, what I didn't mention uh, before is that uh, an initiative for establishing Croatian social science data archive, uh, it's more than uh, 15 years old. So before more than 15 years, there was uh, a group of young, then young researchers uh, uh, who wanted to, to, to have such kind of service. So long before uh, 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 this European initiative, so long before we, we started to talk about European research infrastructures, etc. So back then, uh, CESDA was also on the scene, and CESDA was uh, actually established in 1976. But then, CESDA was not ERIC, CESDA was not part of European research infrastructure because it, it, this didn't exist. But uh, even then, there was this need for social science data archives across the Europe to exchange knowledge and to, to cooperate uh, between each other. And then the development goes further, and then CESDA was included in uh, this uh, ESPRI roadmap. Uh, it, uh, it became uh, in, an important uh, European player uh, in the field of research infrastructures in 2006. Uh, it was recognized as an ESPRI landmark in the 2016 roadmap and became ERIC uh, in, uh, uh, later than, than others in 2017. 
so says the st stakeholders are basically data users, data producers, member countries, and we have 22 members, and we have also one observer and 13 partners. I will not go into detail because uh, uh, people before me uh, talked about uh, the specificities of organization of ERIC. So this is basically similar, but we deal with different topics and what uh, CESDA is dealing with, uh, with social sciences. But uh, what, uh, what is the difference is it says that, that uh, service providers in CESDA are in focus. And that's why I started to talk about Croatian social science data archive first and then about uh, CESDA. Because CESDA serves to us, to service providers, as much as, uh, as to end users, which are data users and data producers. Uh, so CESDA also works uh, around uh, four pillars. Uh, training pillars is very strong, so uh, you can find on YouTube uh, lots of, uh, in recent uh, time, of course, lots of webinars are, are produced. Uh, and also we are taking care about tools so we can find support in community about tools, be it tools for data management, for data archiving, or uh, for, uh, for researchers for data analysis. Uh, we have strong focus on trust. So one of our obligations as service providers uh, is to, um, is to uh, obtain a core trust seal. And this is probably common uh, with, uh, with uh, as I know, with Clarin for sure. Uh, I don't know about Daria, but I suppose some repositories should also go through, uh, through this kind of certification. And also one of the important pillars in uh, CESDA is uh, widening and outreach uh, pillar because uh, uh, CESDA wants to support uh, younger archives as, for instance, Croatian Social Science Archive uh, and uh, achieve, achieve broader, broader influence around the Europe, even, uh, even broader. Uh, so uh, Croatian service provider, we call it CROSDA, uh, is now a uh, national public infrastructure service for the social sciences. The hosting institution is Faculty of Humanities and Social Sciences. We are also financed by the ministry. This is all very similar and uh, 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 and uh, we uh, uh, started uh, the process in 19, uh, in 2019, uh, when the ministry decided to become a member of CESDA ERIC, but also uh, uh, some before, some later, uh, 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 we had this membership in other ERICs uh, as well. Uh, so, as I said, we have some obligations uh, as a service providers. Uh, one of them is uh, to achieve this core trust seal. Uh, and another important one uh, is to provide data for the central catalog. So our main uh, mission is to uh, collect data from researchers all around Croatia. Uh, and then provide it to, uh, to the main uh, central catalog uh, that has the, says that is developing and says that currently has more, have more than 3,000 data sets in this uh, catalog, just to show you what, what we have now in the community. Uh, we are also, I will just now uh, quickly go through a few tools that CESDA is uh, developing and providing primarily for service providers. And uh, one of them is, uh, and this is very valuable one, uh, is a data management expert guide, uh, which can guide researchers through the whole uh, research process. And uh, all of you who were involved in European projects, you know that you have this obligation of creating the data management plan. So this guy can, uh, can help you in achieving that. In achieving that. Uh, so uh, we are, of course, uh, following standards. And because of that, we can uh, exchange uh, metadata uh, uh, between different, uh, different systems. We rely on this uh, DDI metadata standard, uh, which is a specific standard for describing uh, not just data sets in uh, social sciences, but also the whole workflow of creating a research 
uh, of creating, let's say, a survey, so you can have a control on uh, uh, different variants of questionnaires and translations of questions, etc. Et uh, and based on this uh, rich uh, metadata standards, we are able to produce a so-called uh, question bank. Uh, and uh, this is still not yet ready in CESDA, but uh, we are working on it. So researchers will be able to access this European question bank. Uh, and find uh, uh, questions that are asked in previous research, so uh, to, to make uh, their research more comparable to, to what was done previously. Uh, also, from the infrastructure point of view, uh, we are developing uh, a thesaurus uh, for better discoverability of data. Uh, we have this uh, rich uh, vocabulary service, uh, we have a metadata validator. This helps us uh, to include our metadata in uh, says the data catalog. And that was very quick for me, from me because I didn't want to go in, into detail. Uh, I knew that Professor Tadic will, 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 would, would be talking a lot about ethics and everything else. So I just wanted to focus on uh, our specificities and leave uh, some uh, some space for questions. Introduction. Uh, my name is Luka Jurkovic, um, and uh, I'm a member of the Department of Sociology at the Faculty of Humanities and Social Sciences at the University of Zagreb. Uh, along uh, with my colleagues Jelena Ostojic and Dragan Bagic, uh, we are members of the national team for ESS ERIC uh, in Croatia, with Dragan Bagic being the uh, national coordinator who unfortunately couldn't uh, present today, so I will be filling it. Uh, today I will talk a little bit about uh, what ESS ERIC is, uh, and then we'll uh, define some of the challenges uh, and the significance of uh, the European Social Survey uh, for Croatian researchers in particular. So uh, European Social Survey is an academically driven cross-national survey uh, that measures the attitudes, uh, beliefs, and uh, behavioral patterns uh, in more than 30 European nations. So every two years since the first wave, which was conducted in 2002 and 2003, uh, one hour face-to-face -face interviews are conducted with newly selected uh, cross-sectional samples in all participating countries. Uh, so far, 38 countries have participated in at least one round uh, of the European Social Survey, with uh, 15 countries uh, having participated at least once uh, in all nine rounds. I'm, I'm, I'm sorry. Uh, so uh, the questionnaire uh, for the ESS has been translated into 50 languages, and over uh, 420,000 interviews uh, have been conducted uh, from round one to round nine. Uh, the ESS data is uh, freely available uh, on, uh, on their website uh, for non-commercial use uh, and is available either as a uh, country-specific file uh, or an integrated uh, international data, data set, uh, which includes data from all countries uh, that have participated in a single round. The latest uh, available uh, round uh, and data set is for round nine, which had, uh, for which the data collection had taken place in 2018 and 2019, and preparations for round 10 are currently underway with uh, the fieldwork period being uh, extended primarily due to COVID-19 restrictions uh, in uh, European countries. Uh, however, uh, some countries uh, are nearing the end uh, of the fieldwork period and some countries have even uh, finished uh, this data collection period by now. Um, so the ESS has uh, over 170,000 registered users uh, and over uh, 5,200 uh, journal articles, book chapters, conference papers, so forth, uh, uh, have relied on ESS data uh, from these nine rounds. 
So uh, DSS was uh, first developed at the uh, European Science Foundation in 1995 by uh, Sir Roger Jowell and Max, uh, Max uh, Kasse. Uh, and in 2005, uh, the ESS became the first social science project uh, that had won uh, the Descartes Prize. And it was also selected uh, uh, awarded the LPV uh, award uh, by the Comparative Politics section of the American Political uh, Science Association. Uh, it was named uh, on roadmap and as a landmark in 2016 and 2018. Uh, and in 2013, uh, it became a, a European Research Infrastructure uh, Consortium. So it, it received ERIC status uh, in 2013. Uh, the core scientific team of the European Social Survey uh, is comprised of uh, ESS headquarters, uh, which is hosted by uh, a city, uh, University of London, uh, and along with six other institutions, which are uh, GESIS from Germany, NSD from Norway, uh, SCP from the Netherlands, and the uh, Universita Pompeo Fabra from Spain, University of Ex Essex, and University of Ljubljana. These are the core scientific team which make uh, the decisions uh, on source questionnaire, design modules, and so forth. So, like I said earlier, uh, 15 countries uh, out of the 38 who have participated at least once have participated in all nine rounds. Uh, as you can see from uh, this uh, from this map, there is a, quite a bit of a divide between uh, West, uh, Central, and North European countries on one hand, and uh, Eastern and Southeast European countries on the other, uh, which is pro uh, primarily due to uh, difficulties in getting funding in the earliest stages of the ESS. Uh, so the ESS questionnaire uh, uh, consists of a collection of questions that can broadly be classified into two main groups. Uh, so there is a core section uh, and a rotating section. The core section uh, or the core module uh, focuses on a range of different themes uh, that are, remain largely the same in each round. So they are repeated in each round uh, and can be used to track uh, different kinds of social processes over time. Uh, on the other hand, the rotating section or the rotating module uh, is dedicated to specific themes uh, that are sometimes repeated, but uh, mostly in every round, uh, the two rotating sections are different and uh, are, can be used uh, to explore innovative themes uh, every round in detail. So the, the questions that compose the core questionnaire, the core module, uh, refer mainly to uh, usage of uh, different kinds of media, such as the internet and so forth, uh, different political and socio-political questions, uh, such as trust in others, trust in institutions, political participation, and so on. Uh, also, uh, different kinds of questions that pertain to subjective well-being, social inclusion, uh, crime, religion, ethnic identification, and so on. Uh, uh, we have questions uh, that pertain to sociodemographic profile. So we measure uh, sex, age, marital status, uh, education, uh, and, and different kinds of other sociodemographic variables. Uh, the human value scale, uh, which has been uh, selected from the, from the first round. Uh, and these are the questions that largely remain the same. So these uh, on this slides are represented the uh, rotating modules. Uh, some of them have been repeated uh, in, in two rounds, uh, but in each round uh, they are different. Uh, for round nine, uh, which was the last uh, round we have data set for, uh, we measured justice and fairness and timing of life. And for round 10, uh, uh, which is currently underway, the rotating modules are uh, understanding and evaluation of democracy on one hand and digital social contexts in work and family life on the other. 
so uh, as far as uh, academic publications that use ESS data are concerned, uh, there has been a steady rise of uh, academic publications that use this data from 2005 to 2019, uh, as well as uh, the number of registered users, uh, which is currently uh, a little over 170,000 uh, registered users. Uh, most of these users, over 60% are students uh, and followed by uh, faculty of uh, of different kinds of institutions, uh, universities, of course, and followed by PhD students. So uh, we're going to talk a little bit about uh, why the ESS uh, ERIC is significant for Croatian researchers. Uh, so in Croatia, uh, Croatia has participated in the European Social Survey uh, in three rounds so far. The first one was uh, round four, which, uh, for which the data collection period had taken place in 2008 and 2009, uh, which was followed by round five, which was two years later. Uh, and then um, uh, there was a seven year long hiatus for which, in which Croatia didn't participate in uh, the ESS. Uh, and then in 2018, in round nine, Croatia uh, entered ESS again uh, uh, and of course, the fieldwork for round 10 is currently in progress. Uh, the innovation for round 10 for Croatia in particular uh, is that uh, this round we use a sampling frame of individuals, uh, which is quite different to anything we had before, uh, which was a sampling frame of uh, addresses. Uh, uh, what the sampling frame of individuals mean is that uh, the clustering effect, the design effect due to clustering uh, is significantly lower. Uh, so most um, individuals which have been selected uh, for the European Social Survey in Croatia have had the same sampling probability uh, for being chosen. Uh, so the data for round 10, which is uh, almost coming to uh, uh, the data collection period is coming to a close in the following month, the data will be available uh, free of charge on their website in the second half of 2022. Uh, so why is uh, ESS important uh, for creation researchers in the social sciences? Uh, well, uh, when making inferences in social sciences, about different kinds of social processes that uh, go on within and across European uh, societies. Uh, uh, it is uh, nearly, uh, it is very difficult to do, uh, to make inferences about these social processes uh, without the comparative method. So uh, to make inference in social sciences, uh, to uh, implement the experiment as a method of, of statistical inference, uh, is, is oftentimes impossible. So the comparative method uh, is, is a, a way in which we can make, uh, in which we can isolate the specificities of a certain society by comparing it to other societies. Uh, of course, uh, due to it being a biannual uh, survey, uh, the European Social Survey enables us to compare the processes that go on within Croatia uh, uh, during time. So uh, this, uh, this is the only uh, survey uh, in Croatia that measures different kinds of social processes so frequently uh, and so consistently. So uh, uh, this is really important to track social processes uh, within a society through time. Uh, uh, another really important strength of the European Social Survey is that it uh, uh, insists on implementing high quality uh, standards in methodology. Uh, this pertains to uh, from designing modules, uh, questionnaire development and translation, all the way to sampling design, uh, data collection uh, strategies, uh, and uh, data quality assessment. So. Uh, all participating countries must adhere to this set of standards, uh, which ensures that um, in all participating countries uh, produce high quality data. Um, 
as we've seen uh, from the, the coverage of topics, uh, the ESS covers a broad selection of topics in the core module, which allows us to monitor uh, change in social processes, both within and across European societies. Uh, uh, furthermore, each round two rotating modules expand this selection. And what that allows us to do is uh, to explore innovative uh, topics uh, more thoroughly than, than uh, would be allowed by, uh, by other uh, international comparative research. Um, what the ESS also allows uh, is a wide range of analytical possibilities. Uh, for example, the ESS provides uh, a resource on their website uh, that makes it possible to add information about countries and uh, several regional uh, uh, levels to the respondents of the ESS data. So in other words, uh, what we can do is tie individual data from the ESS to country level and regional level variables, which then allows us to uh, conduct multi-level analysis. Um, finally, uh, as we've seen, there is a steady growing uh, community of over 170,000 researchers, academics, students, policymakers, so forth, that are interested in this data, uh, which allows for uh, expansive networking and uh, collaboration uh, opportunities. Uh, another example of this is that the ESS has developed their own uh, bibliographic uh, database, uh, which will soon be publicly available, uh, that will allow to browse, uh, browse all academic papers uh, which used ESS data uh, that have been published, uh, and even to search specific variables within the ESS dataset. Uh, in this way, researchers can easily uh, see which authors uh, examined relationships that are of interest to them, uh, and perhaps then collaborate in the future. Uh, finally, uh, uh, the, uh, there have been uh, regular online seminars for researchers that have allowed them to present their works uh, that are based on uh, ESS data. It also provides uh, several opportunities for participation uh, in ESS ERIC development pro projects, uh, another example of this would be uh, the establishment of a pan-European uh, panel, uh, so a longitudinal study, uh, which has been called uh, Kronos, which is uh, a pan-European panel uh, for social research. Um, so how to ensure the full potential of, uh, of ESS ERIC uh, in Croatia? Uh, well, in order to uphold the benefits uh, of the infrastructure, it is important to uh, ensure a stable participation uh, in as many rounds as possible. So as I described earlier, um, Croatia has participated in round four and five, and then uh, uh, this, this participation was interrupted by a seven-year-old, uh, seven-year uh, hiatus until its uh, eventual inclusion uh, in round nine again. Uh, so stable participation uh, is is uh, is a key. Uh, uh, it is it is uh, so. Imp it is. I'm sorry. Uh, stable participation is uh, extremely important to maintain these benefits of ESS Eric infrastructure, uh, and this has partly been resolved uh, and made possible uh, by full membership in ESS Eric and also with the support of. Uh, the Ministry of Science and Education. Uh, finally, we uh, as national members of, uh, of ESS in Croatia are uh, working on informing the scientific community. So uh, one of our key uh, goals is to raise awareness of ESS among Croatian researchers, especially doctoral students and the faculty members about Croatia's involvement in ESS and to increase uh, uh the the usage of vss data among uh, croatian researchers uh, finally we are also building a uh, research community uh, we established an ess council uh, and are about to publish a thematic issue of uh, a scientific journals with uh, with papers that use uh, that rely on ess data uh, based uh, in croatia 
and are planning to organize conferences and workshops that are based on ESS data as well. Uh, finally, uh, ESS also have several applications for policy analysis. So uh, uh, we are working hard on popularizing uh, of ESS Eric as a framework for policy analysis. So um, uh, policymakers can use evidence-based uh, data to, to, to make policies. Uh, finally, we are working uh, on creating this center of excellence, as we as we like to call it here, uh, uh, national members, uh, for survey research, uh, and are working hard on dissemination and uh, implementation of these rigorous uh, methodological standards and experiences which we have gained by working on ESS uh, in other national projects. Uh, so uh, that is all uh, I have prepared today. Thank you. Thank you for listening.
Very strange situation. Next year, any scientific data coming up, if they are pushed under the mat, they are somehow censored. The MIT would be open, absolutely open, even for completely different endpoints, for completely different interpretations, for completely different. Um, if you want to conflicts in the scientific uh, communities, so this is extremely important because I believe that's the only way that uh, we can really come to the what the truth really is. Otherwise, if it's uh, controlled, and I'm thinking openly here on big big tech and their role in social networks that are really controlling incredibly things. I mean, look at the last eighteen months, what's going on there? Okay. Uh, and I'm not talking about political things, you know, that you can uh, this, you know, switch off the Twitter account of the president of the United States. Whatever you want to think about that in person, okay? I'm talking about Nobel Prize winners who are not allowed to give their thoughts about certain problems from their own area of expertise. So I'm very much afraid of intrusion of big tech, commercial, and unfortunately also politically supporting a strong impact on what and how research data will be available and how that will be. Thank you, It's part of yesterday talk, and this conference is also. Uh, yeah, so I can just add to what was previously said, and uh, maybe for us, from the perspective of an archive, is uh, one challenge themselves that data is not scary, that sharing data can benefit their own work and that there are mechanisms even in social sciences even in areas where you deal with sensitive and personal data that there are trust mechanisms that can be implemented for safely sharing the data that's all great we are now coming to conclusion uh, EST is a research data lake and there are still nine data lakes in european data strategy open governments are the next one luca can you bring us you into this room <laughs> what would you pick as a great challenge of uh, national perspective on, on research infrastructure on european research infrastructure? Uh, well uh, it is difficult for me uh, to speak about the all the organizational and uh, infrastructural challenges that that um, come about in this kind of uh, uh, projects. Uh, seeing as I am a research associate that is primarily focused on uh, research implementation, uh, but uh, what we have seen uh, from these uh, past few years uh, uh, that are that are can be said about the difficulties of conducting research uh, is uh, primarily that uh, we have coming to uh, a real difficulty in conducting face-to-face -face interviews, uh, seeing as uh, the response rates are, are dwindling uh, more and more uh, in certain European countries. And um, uh, so uh, certain solutions are, are coming about, such as uh, a self, uh, 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 so, I'm sorry. Uh, so certain solutions are coming about, such as self-completion uh, interviews, uh, but the research needs to be done uh, in order to see if it, it truly is a feasible solution. So, um, but as, as I said, as, as for the infrastructural uh, uh, difficulties, that is something that I will have to leave uh, to more experienced colleagues. If I can inter interpret what Muka just said, it's basically uh, reality. Data is not in the center. The researcher is in the center. So thank you, Luca, for, for this perspective. So research is very important. It's, it's nice to see a researcher with his mood. No more clinician moods from the audience, so I can give a word to foreigners. <laughs> 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 <laughs>
you know, I, I would just like to add, um, you asked me before, what is something that has to be done to build a sustainable uh, environment for you? And, and thank you so much for making sure that every research infrastructure it's, you know, having people that are staff that can dedicate the time that is necessary. It takes a lot of work to run research infrastructure, whether it is international or national, and making sure that there are people there that are so honestly, thank you. I, I wish it was the same at every national consortium. Well, <laughs> I sort of like me as a minister. <laughs> <laughs> it's not the most salary of at the about at the end. Yeah, it's a, well, the salary is a, no, no, the yeah. of the of the rate, you know, uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, post graduate and postdoc. I just made suggestions from heritage institutions' perspective. So, lack of cooperation between scientific world, academic research world, and heritage institutions because they are completely lack of uh, digital skills, digital equipment. I don't have to say how many. Yeah. And all this stuff. So we are completely uh, un unprepared in any cases, uh, starting from infrastructure, from how many uh, data are available. There are uh, no technology to do it. There are no uh, knowledge to do it. Uh, no idea where this uh, data will be stored, digitized material, and how the research. Researchers will uh, access to this data because I know from my perspective that majority of researchers who want to do or to research something material that are stored as we saw today mm -hmm. in this platform. The biggest problem is how to access the data, how to find it because it's completely unavailable in digital form. One of the aspects of research infrastructure is to, to build training. Platform and the training platform is very important. How do you make digital skills in the community, but not just the research community, but also society at large, citizen at large, this is also very important. And uh, thank you for this opinion, it's very valuable. If you are not aware, there is a different mechanism how to make research industry and uh, public sector together. In Europe, there is the European Digital Innovation Hub, the Center of Excellence, that I showed here in the Luca presentation. In Croatia, we have a different form, as in Hungary, Western Scientific Association, Scientific Research Excellence. In Europe, uh, there is a board of four or five candidates of the Croatian EDIC, which is a new form run by the Ministry of Entrepreneurship. But I didn't see any of these edicts coming from social science. I see it robotics, artificial intelligence, STEM fields, but none of them is related to, to SSH or H field. And this is what, what is innovative in, in, in Europe. We will not repeat robotics in every country, but we have to be innovative. And, and sometimes I think from social science and humanities, there is a delay in opening these new frontiers on which there are some European So I wish us all better success, less challenges in the future, and let's embrace the people. <laughs> Thank you very much for, for this session. Enjoy the rest of the day.